You are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW and 106.1 KZCC Conroe and worldwide on the IRLoneStar.com. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Weekly Business Hour. I'm Rick Schisler, your host. I'm a Silver Fox advisor and the founder of OneBestConsult.com. Well, welcome to today's show. Uh, the Weekly Business Hour, in case you're a new listener, is where Montgomery County and, quite frankly, now businesses throughout the world come to talk about the latest in business news, ideas to improve your business, and to be part of a conversation that we hope can make a real difference in your business. First of all, I want to give a mention to and a big shout out to our sponsor, One Best Consult. Dot com. That's the number one, bestconsult.com. As I mentioned earlier, I founded this website. The main purpose is to provide a community for small business owners, a place where they can go and share issues, challenges, and get advice and comment from their fellow business people. All of this is done in confidentiality, with uh, anonymity, and but it's a great opportunity because many times as small business people, we don't have a place or someone we can call on when we've got a particular challenge or business issue or business opportunity. So I encourage you to check it out at One Best Consult, the number one bestconsult.com. And remember, those of you who are able, we're on Facebook Live. Go to Facebook, go to the Weekly Business Hour page and click on, and you can watch as well as listen to the show live. And one more reminder, email If you have a question during the show or after the show or comment about the show or particularly a, a, say, a business issue, something that's on your mind, I'd be glad to take a look at it and give you a response. Just send me an email at onebestconsult at gmail.com. That's onebestconsult at gmail.com. With this point, it gets real easy for you, the listener. Just sit back, grab your pad and pencil, and get ready to take notes as we talk about everything business right here on the weekly business hour. And I'm happy to say that our guest today is returning second part of a three-part series with Doug Thorpe. Doug's a well-known author, speaker, and business coach. And he is here in the second part of our three-part series on soup to nuts conversation entitled Building Better Teams by Becoming a Better Leader. So take a listen, hear what Doug has to say. We are visiting with Doug Thorpe. Uh, Doug Thorpe is the uh, talking to us about building better teams by becoming a better leader. And Doug, we've been talking a lot about the attributes, uh, the six attributes that you have in your team trust model. Uh, but there's some other issues I know that you want to talk about. Kind of give us a recap of, of that conversation, and then we'll move forward. Yeah, thanks, Rick. You know, the idea of how do we build a better team has been written about by some some great business writers like uh, Stephen Covey and John Collins. And, you know, they use interesting phrases like get the right people on the bus. And while I, I think those are absolutely true, I guess the direction I'm coming from and, and why I call this building better teams by becoming a better leader I firmly believe it's the leader's role to kind of set the course for what the team's going to be doing. And absolutely, once you get a vision, you, you've got to try to recruit for and train up the right people to be on it. But finding that moment of clarity to communicate to everybody is so critical. And I can't tell you time and time again, I'll go into a client's operation and find out that there is a giant question mark hovering over the whole enterprise. The leader thinks they've done a good job of telling a story or, you know, maybe they've got a fancy vision statement on the wall and everybody's supposed to just automatically get it. But when you get that team assembled in a room and you start having that discussion, um, it's amazing how many times there really isn't that perfect clarity. 
And you know, you say perfect clarity. I've even bumped into situations myself in the work I do. There is almost no clarity. And I, and I had a smile when you said that sign on the wall, in that case, a mission or a vision statement. And, and a lot of times that's the lift service. We put up the sign, we right. work up the, the vision statement, and then we just stick it on the wall and say, well, that takes care of it. Right. That's <laughs> right. And and I routinely see teams that have come together, and there's a lot of assumption about what the purpose is and, you know, why everybody is gathered. But yet, when you really start polling and you say, all right, this means X, Y, and Z, you'll get two or three hands around the table going, no, I don't think we do that here. I don't think that's what we are about. And then that's where the leader needs to be able to, to bring that clarity. So I guess the bottom line, you might say, if you're the leader, manager, owner, you can't assume anything about the understanding of that clarity. And that clarity is so critical for your team to be able to rally around it, make a personal commitment to participate in that, and then carry the process forward. What are some ways that we can help the leader? I mean, as you say, in your opinion, it centers around this leader. What are some things we can do to help them? Well, I, that's a great question. And I'm thinking about a case in point recently I had. I, I had a client I was actually asked to come attend a, a team meeting event where people were being gathered. They don't normally get to work close to each other because they're geographically dispersed but they do make it a habit to periodically come together. And um, I asked the question, does everybody understand why you're here and what you're doing? And they looked at me like I had a third eye. But then I said, no, seriously, can each of you articulate the purpose for this team? And sure enough, um, as I recall, there were nine members of that team. We had eight different answers for what the real core purpose of the team was. It was an eye-opener to the executive who was running the team. He was certain he had done a good job of communicating the clarity, and both as a team and one-on-one -on -one when he was talking with his people. But in fact, it was obvious that wasn't the case. So the, uh, the agenda for the day became more about resetting that vision, trying to achieve the clarity so that then he could... Uh, he could ask for the commitment from the team on what they were doing. Just to ask you in that example, if you recall, what was the impression uh, on the team, on the, on the leader of that team, when you went around the room, polled everybody, and he saw what, was, what has happened or what was happening? What kind of impression did he have? Well, fortunately, uh, this executive was a pretty capable leader with uh, some good mileage and good experience behind him. So... While on one hand, I think he was disappointed to hear that the clarity was missing, he was quick to own up. And um, in our earlier segment, I talked about the acronym FAST that stands for Focus, Accountability, Simplicity, and Transparency. In this case, he became incredibly transparent and said, guys, you know, wow, we, we need to take a step back and we need to dive into this because it is important that we have this, this clarity around what we're doing. Let's talk a little bit about clarity. I suspect that some of our listeners uh, are not sure exactly when you talk about clarity what you're really talking about. Can you help us define that? Yeah, in, in simple terms, it's the idea, let, let's take the situation of an entrepreneur who has this brilliant idea for the business they want to create. Well, in your mind, it's crystal clear. You, you know what kind of product you want to create, what kind of service you want to deliver, um, all the different attributes. And so you begin building this team around you, and the clarity you might have in your own mind is not necessarily shared by everyone on the team. So it is, is very important. And, and, you know, it does go back. Uh, also in our first segment, we talked about my six-step team trust model. Uh, step one is the people, you know, they have to ask the question, do I even want to be on this team? Two is the purpose, and three is the plan. That's where the leader really needs to plot the course. They need to be able to get everybody to rally around the right purpose with the right plan so then the individual can vote, you know, with his heart and his mind to make a commitment to the team. Let's talk about that, uh, as you said, vote with uh, to, to the commitment, so to speak. 
what are some ways or a way that, that when I'm trying to develop this clarity with my team, uh, that I really know that they're understanding and, and getting that feedback. In other words, it's not just a yes answer, yes, I understand, or whatever. What are some ways that I can, can check in, so to speak, to make sure that they are on board with what we're doing? Well, again, a great question. I, I think in the spirit of trying to build a high level of trust for your team, the, the leader needs to be willing to establish that one-on-one -on -one relationship with each team member. And in that process of talking one-on-one -on -one with your team, you need to uh, ask those questions. Um, you, can, you can ask for feedback. You know, if you had, if you just came out of a team meeting and somebody you can tell by their body language is balking or not so sure about what you're talking about, pull them off to the side, you know, very calmly and politely ask for feedback. Say, what did you hear? I sensed a pause in, in your spirit about what we're doing here. And, you know, you, 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 the person could have been vocal or maybe they weren't vocal, but you saw indications they weren't getting it. So you've got to take that person offline and, and try to work with them and find out exactly where they are. You know, my sense of this is, particularly if I have a new team, so I have new business or I'm growing a business and I've added people fairly quickly as I'm growing, I'm being successful, so to speak, in one sense of the word, that uh, I've got some real work to do as a leader to make sure each one of those team members, particularly as they're newer, if you will, to the business, to the company, uh, that they are on board, that they get it. Mm -hmm. And they're, and again, they buy into it and are willing to support it. Mm -hmm. Anything, any advice there of what to do? I mean, uh, you got you had the meeting. You just mentioned an example where you pulled one off to the side that you were able to tell wasn't connecting or on the same page. What about, the, I mean, this is a project. I mean, this is something you got to work on. Yeah, it is. It, it's really an ongoing project. It, it is a challenge for leadership to stay with it, stay the course, um, work through this process. But that's why my experience has shown me that this team trust model that I'm an advocate of is such an interesting uh, roadmap to to get you get your team to a higher levels of performance. Specific to your question. You know, that individual that's kind of lagging, if the rest of the team is is on pace and getting it, if the right level of trust has been established, they help each other. They, um, they pull each other along. They realize when someone is not getting it or having a challenge, um, perhaps something in the business has changed and five out of six have gotten it and that sixth person is lagging or missing it, they actually end up helping themselves as a team pull together, bring that person along, and um, actually help the leader by not putting the 100% responsibility on the leader to make that happen. You know, you've said something really important, and I, I want to make sure that our listeners all get it, and that's the fact that this process, if you will, is ongoing. It isn't just the meeting and checking in with people that may or may not get it. But it's, it really needs to become part of the, I call the DNA of that leader going forward on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. It really is. When, when we began this discussion, we said the ultimate success of a team really starts with the leader. And that is true. And, and it, it does require a, a constant monitoring, a, a constant feedback to the team members by the leader saying, you know, Yes, we're on course. No, we need to adjust something. I had an expectation of such and such, and, you know, I need you to step it up, pick it up, talk to me why you're not getting this, you know, those kinds of discussions. Sounds like what you're doing is really building a model to build the business, and as such, the leader needs to be, and hopefully all the team members involved in it day to day, and probably some subtle ways as well as some obvious ways. Yeah, and... We have spoken about the idea of uh, hiring is so critically important to that. And I think John Collins in his book, Good to Great, talks about that exhaustively, having done a number of studies on big businesses and how they've been able to do it. You know, it. I guess uh, not to be crude about it, but the old saying, garbage in is garbage out. If you, if you haven't been able to hire the right people to be on your team, 
um, that's going to make it an, a near impossible adjustment to make. So starting with the right people on your team is certainly critical to being able to align everybody, explain the purpose, show them the, your plan, and then talk about how you're going to execute. Well, it makes a lot of sense. Once you get the clarity working with your team, are there some other things you can do to build a better, stronger team? Yeah, the... Um, <clears throat> I, I go back to the six-step model, which we've shared here, and there is an online uh, version of this at uh, on my website, dougthorpe.com slash team trust, one word. That's dougthorpe.com slash team trust. Um, the other steps involve as you, once everybody is aligned with the team, the purpose and the plan, then you've actually, you get into practice and you're out in the trenches doing the job, doing the work, and you have to have kind of a constant feedback process to say, well, is this effort working? What do we need to adjust? If it's a major shift, you got to have some education and learning to help your team understand what the change is. And in a fashion, they, they potentially go all the way back to step one in the, in the model here, asking themselves, wow, with that change, do I still want to be on this team? So it is a, an ever-dynamic loop. And uh, some clients I've worked with, that, that they look at this, they almost challenge and say, well, is this not really similar to Maslow's hierarchy? You start out at step one with basic fundamental needs and you work your way up to self-actualization. And a team goes through that kind of process as well. They start out at a very fundamental level who am I? Why am I here? What are we doing? And then you slowly work up the process until you finally achieve your payoff. And then with the payoff in hand, um, and again, that's either monetary or uh, uh, intangible, as in the case of many nonprofits, with that payoff in hand, you can ask, go back to that front end and say, okay, this is good. Why am I here? Oh, this is great. I want to stay here. Let's do it some more. Well, and that makes a lot of sense is getting that buy-in and someone recognizes that they are where they need to be. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Okay, we've talked about this building, using the model, uh, the team trust model, building that trust up to a point. Uh, kind of double back and look back over that for us, if you would, and talk about really what are the real benefits of using this approach? The the first big benefit is, is the idea that with – with your team hitting on all six cylinders here, you actually start to create big momentum for your business. And you, you cannot underestimate the value of momentum. We, we hear it talked about in sporting events. Uh, you know, the team recovers a fumble and uh, starts driving back for a winning touchdown. Uh, you, they talk about big momentum shifts. Well, in business, momentum is actually very... Uh, tangible also. And as your if your team is really hitting it and, and doing well, working together as a as a well-oiled machine might, you sense that momentum. And what momentum does for you is you might lose a member of your team, life change or whatever takes them away. Uh, putting another person in that slot, if the team is already uh, operating at a high level, that momentum is going to carry them even through that transition with a new member. You know, Doug, you were talking about momentum uh, and how important it is, and, and you really you woke me up a little bit, I'll be frank with you, about, of course, the momentum in sports. I agree. It's in the current basketball playoffs. It's everything, baseball, football, all around us in sports. But I'm not sure that I even think about it that often, that the momentum, once a business is moving and growing, uh, we read these success stories about all the all the the noise that goes on when you're moving forward and everybody's excited and everybody's pulling. But what that is, as you're saying, is a direct result of of using a, a model such as the team trust model and building up your team so that they can create that momentum. Right. Yeah, I think it's safe to say if, if you take the counter position and think about that, I don't know any business that I can think of in my past that is achieving levels of success with constant conflict, frustration, turnover, um, 
retraining, re-educating the team. I don't know any business that is able to achieve their maximum capacity with when that all is going on. So that's what I'm talking about with momentum is when you overcome those things and you start getting a regular rhythm to your business and kind of a hum to the activity that's going on, um, it's, it's seldom that you see a business that has that hum that's not doing some great things. You know, you touched on some important things. You touched on some things that are, I guess, call them negatives in a general sense where, where you have turnover and you have this and that. And if that's going on in your business, that in itself is, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're not, you're not doing well right. if you're not addressing those issues. But then it becomes a recovery effort. If I've got a lot of turnover, my approach typically is, well, I've got to fix that problem. It's not to step back and say, hey, maybe I need to find a new way overall. How do you convince someone that they need, you know, they say, well, I've got a lot of turnover, Doug, help me with this. <laughs> How do you convince them to step back and take a look at something like the, uh, the team trust model? Well, I, I've definitely had that occasion with a client when he presents me with all of his problems and I start proposing some changes and I get pushback and he'll say things like, well, this is the way we've always done it. And the classic retort for me is, why well, is that working out for you? You just gave me a list of problems and don't you think they go hand in hand? So um, there are business situations when ultimately you say to somebody, why don't you just start this over with a different plan? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's a very, I would assume it'd be very challenging to bring that up to somebody that has the obvious signs. And if you're listening to this program, I mean, take a look at your own business. See if you have some of these recurring problems and you can't seem to get past them. And I think it's because you're, you're just trying to fix that problem. You're not addressing the whole. Well, Doug, as we, if, as we wind down this part of our conversation, uh, I think it'd be a great idea, if you don't mind, share with us some case studies, some actual cases or situations uh, that you've been in that reflect uh, the real value of, of following the, the team trust model. Yeah, uh, one that comes immediately to mind, I, I know of a situation where the team is comprised of some very highly skilled, uh, highly trained, highly technical people, and the team leader made the quick assumption that everybody got it, that the team had been constituted for a particular mission. I think the team leader was thinking, well, these guys are smart. They've been doing this a long time. Certainly, uh, we can just go to work and everything will be fine. And yet, uh, when the team was pulled together and the discussion about clarity came up, uh, which I basically ask every team meeting I'm in just to get a gauge on where they might be, the, um, the answer was no. You know, I've got my P's, he's got her P, uh, his P's, her P's, et cetera, et cetera. So the assumption based on technical expertise is not a good one. I think it goes without saying that regardless of the skill and education of your people, there's still always that need for that, you know, proverbial flag to go in the sand for everybody to rally around and say, no, this is what we're about. This is what we need to be doing. Now let's have the discussion, how can we leverage our strengths and talents to get there? Well, yeah, that, that old word of assumption, we know about that. <laughs> it bites each and every time. Why not right here? Right. Makes sense that that happens. Right. Any other case studies jump out to you, uh, jump out in your mind that uh, would help people understand uh, or tangibilize, so to speak? Well, I'll tell a story on myself. I, I, I have alluded to it before and in my own experience trying to start up a company I was too quick to assume that everybody could understand the mission. I thought we had a very clear definition of the service we were going to be providing. I thought it was pretty simple to understand. And as I brought people into the team, um, the, the training was marginal at best. And I'm, again, I'm telling a story on myself. Training was marginal at best. And then uh, people were handed a book of business to go get busy on. And next thing I knew... Things were popping up, um, pieces of the deliverables that we were re responsible for were not getting done correctly, and the service levels I slash my company was delivering were not that great. 
So it, it took some real adjustment to the process with the people I had. I got real aggressive with evaluating who I had and made some intentional cuts to the team. Changed my whole recruiting practice. Uh, in this case, I actually created a practical test I gave recruits to not just talk me through what they thought they knew about our business, but show me what they knew about our business. My success in re recruiting went, well, I would say through the roof, and the ability to um, have a team that was operating at a much higher level grew very rapidly after that. Now, one of the things, just kind of pick on one little issue, and we've talked about it really in, in in our first conversation and now in this conversation, is a leader really needs to develop some skills as far as evaluating hiring people. Yep. I hear that time and again. Uh, any quick thoughts on that to encourage someone to, to develop those skills? Well, I think the quick answer is not to make it sound oversimplified, but if, if you're not happy with the quality of hires you're making, something's got to change. You either need to uh, reevaluate your own process or your own decision making uh, or find better alternatives on how to evaluate that. Like I mentioned in my example, I actually created a practical test to give to recruits rather than talking through the business because our business was one that was a lot of people knew the vocabulary of the industry and could talk it through without really knowing anything about the work at all. So we created this practical test and that really uh, made a change. I actually had recruits, we told them they were gonna take a practical test and they declined the interview. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that is interesting in yep. and of itself. Yep. Yeah, a lot of traps out there in the, in the interviewing process and it's something I've personally been blessed to have a lot of opportunity for training and, and attend seminars and uh, molded uh, a process together and it's a never learning thing. but. Obviously, it's a key to a successful business. There's just no doubt about it. Hiring the right people for the right slot. Absolutely. Well, Doug, I've enjoyed this part of the conversation as I did the first. Uh, I think uh, we, I'm kind of excited we're going to have a third conversation and kind of bring everything into focus, so to speak. And I hope you as listeners have enjoyed this and uh, re-listened to it. Uh, there's a lot of good takeaways in this conversation. So, Doug, thanks. And we'll be with you again next week. OneBestConsult.com, a community of small business owners where you as an owner can find answers to the most pressing business questions you have. Not sure who to turn to when you have a challenge in your business? Turn to the folks at OneBestConsult.com. That's the number one BestConsult.com, where you can always find advice you can use based on common sense business experience. Join our community of like-minded business owners at OneBestConsult.com. Well, I want to offer a big thank you to Doug Thorpe for joining us again on our Soup to Nuts conversation. This was the second in a three-part series, and next Monday on June 24th, we'll be live with the third and final part of that conversation. So I hope you'll make a note and join us. You know, Doug is the creator of Leadership Powered by Common Sense. He's also the author of what I think is a really great book, uh, The Uncommon Commodity, the Common Sense Guide for New Managers. And don't let the new managers part throw you. If you own a business and your first time in business or, or even if it's your second or third, you're a manager. Potentially, you're a new manager. So it's a very good book, Common Sense Guide for New Managers uh, is its subtitle. So I encourage you to do that. If you want to contact Doug, you heard something, you're interested, you want to follow up with a question or see what he can do perhaps to help you in your business, it's real simple. His website is www.dougthorpe, and that's spelled T-H-O-R-P-E dot com. Well, I hope you will stay with us for the second half of today's show. Uh, first off, we'll uh, recap uh, what Doug had to say today. I'll offer you a couple tips and maybe some advice that you can glean from it that would help you even perhaps today in your business. And then in our Did You Know segment, I'm going to offer Did You Know That You Can Build Your Own Referral Hiring System? Difficult time throughout the country in hiring people right now. Having your own referral hiring system can make a critical difference. And finally, my one best consult tip of the week, three must do's if you want to succeed in business. There are a lot of things you need to do to be successful, but I believe there are three 
key critical things you must do if you want to succeed. So please stay with us. We'll be right back with you. Listen to the Weekly Business Hour on Lone Star Community Radio. A Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's radio station with talk, music, weather, and traffic for Montgomery County. Have a question or comment about one of our shows? Want to know how to reach a host? Just contact the station at IRLoneStar.com or call in and leave a message at 936 647 3776. Get involved with your community with Lone Star Community Radio. From the beginning, the main purpose of the Cooperative Extension Service has been to change human behavior by teaching people how to apply the results of scientific research. By utilizing a holistic, multi level approach, Extension Family and Community Health Programs encourage health and well being for everyone, addressing values, concerns, and needs with reliable science based information. Extension programs help people lead healthier lives. We are Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, helping Texans make their lives better. Hey, guys, this is Connor. This is Dick. This is Chris. And we're with the Ticket Stub Podcast every Thursday live at noon on 104.5 and 106.1 FM in the Conroe area. Also, anytime at IRLoneStar.com. You go to IRLoneStar.com backslash TTS. You can find all of our social media. And don't forget, we give away two tickets to the Grand Theater on every show. If you like movies and you like complaining or celebrating anything that has to do with the silver screen, check out the Ticket Stub podcast and join us every Thursday at noon o'clock on Lone Star Community Radio. It's all business talk on the weekly business hour every Monday at 11 a.m. right here on Lone Star Community Radio. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to the Weekly Business Hour, and I'm your host, Rick Schisler. Well, in this segment, uh, I want to start off by doing a quick recap of what we heard from Doug Thorpe today in the previous half hour. But before I do that, I want to remind you that a podcast, videocast of the show, will be available on Wednesday of this week. It's posted in a number of social media sites, as well as here on the station, IRLoneStar.com's website. Just look for the Weekly Business Hour page here at the station's website, onebestconsult.com, YouTube, and so on and so forth. So be sure to check out the podcast if you missed something, or I really would personally appreciate it if you consider sharing what you saw and heard today on the Weekly Business Hour. Let's recap that conversation with Doug Thorpe. Uh, He covered a lot of ground, but a couple of things really stand out to me that could I could utilize when I had my businesses some things that that really hit directly at what could be done really immediately to improve your business, make it more efficient and therefore more profitable. Uh, First and foremost, he talked a lot directly and indirectly about communication and clarity. Communication with you and your business, this is something that's one of the most important things we do every day. We come into a business, we communicate. We come to our own business, we communicate. We communicate with the workforce, the people who work there. We communicate potentially with customers. We communicate with vendors uh, and also people who provide us with services, such as our lawyer, accountant, uh, other folks that do things as vendors, as I mentioned, supply us with products and services. So communications, be sure that you're doing the very best you can with communications with your employees. Now, in Doug's case, clarity. He called it clarity. Uh, And he mentioned, I think we finally kind of boiled it down, what does clarity mean and defined it as clarity is the ability, and this is my take on it, the ability to get everyone that's in your workforce on the same page. In other words, everybody's purpose for being there, everybody's goal and what they're trying to accomplish is on the same page. Everybody's pulling, pushing the same way because that's critical because if you have an employee, for an example, say you have three employees or you have 30 or 300 or 3,000. If you've got an employee, you have three employees and you have one who's just not on the same page with you. Say he or she is just there to draw a check, really has no interest in your business. And I'm giving an extreme example and there are a lot of in-between positions to this you're going to suffer. The other people on the team are going to suffer. Uh, Dramatic impact. And the same is true, again, whether you have 30, 300, or 3,000. When you have a person or persons 
who don't understand their purpose for being there in the business, not only what their job is, not only to punch in and out, but understand their purpose, then you have created a negative situation that you really don't have to have. You don't need. There are enough challenges, say, from the outside world that we do business in to have those kinds of challenges bubble up, if you will, in our own business. So it's important that we do seek clarity and get everyone on the same page. The other thing that I picked up from what Doug said was, to me was interesting, was the idea that you build this team. You take and build their skills. And uh, he gave an example that I thought was pretty interesting. And I made a note here I wanted to to go back to. It was a business uh, where he was holding a group meeting, had eight or nine people uh, that were on a team that worked for a company, meaning team, and don't get confused, that's not a big corporate term, but it, uh, in this sense, it's a group. It could have been those were the only nine employees in the company. And he polled them and says, why are you here? What do you understand your purpose is? What do you understand the purpose of the company is? And he got eight different answers. Now, the owner of the company, or in this case, the manager, had a purpose, understood why they are there, and was really totally surprised that people, that many people working under him, for him, with him, didn't understand. So it happens. You think you've got those people understanding what you're trying to accomplish. And I'm talking about the big picture as well as the day-to-day. The throughput, the cash register ringing, these are easy things to understand. Those are more of a skill set of what we do, but it's the reason we're there. What is this company trying to do? Where is it kind of trying to go? Is it trying to grow or is it just want to kind of rock along? Uh, that's a very general, but there are a lot of things to understand and establish your pur- purpose and so on and so forth. You build your culture. We're going to take a short break and we come back. I'm going to do you did my Did You Know segment. It's entitled, Did You Know That You Could Build Your Own Referral Hiring System Today Right In Your Business? So please stay with us and we'll be right back. business on the weekly business hour every Monday at 11 a.m. on Lone Star Community Radio. A Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's radio station with talk, music, weather, and traffic for Montgomery County. Have a question or comment about one of our shows? Want to know how to reach a host? Just contact the station at IRLoneStar.com or call in and leave a message at 936 647 3776. Get involved with your community with Lone Star Community Radio. Hispanic Chamber Connections with Dr. Carlos Sanchez, president of the Woodlands Conroe Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, featuring event announcements, member highlights, and more. Tuesdays at 1 p.m., broadcasting from the heart of Conroe, Texas on IRLoneStar.com and Conroe's FM 104.5. 106.1. Is there someone you know who is hooked on vintage aircraft? Follow the commemorative Air Force and its fleet of World War II planes, including the mighty B-17 Flying Fortress Texas Raiders, which is based in Conroe, Texas. Texas Raiders tours locally and all around the United States, offering the public a chance to put their hands on aviation history. What could be a more perfect gift and a flight on a historic B-17. Taking to the sky on the iconic bomber is an experience that will never be forgotten. For the touring schedule, reservations, or more information, go to b17texasraiders.org or call 855-FLY-A-B-17. For business ideas and news you can use, join us on the weekly business hour every Monday at 11 a.m. on Lone Star Community Radio. You are listening to the Weekly Business Hour, and this is Rick Schisler, your host. Uh, We're at the Did You Know segment of today's show. Did you know that you can build your own referral hiring system? Uh, This is something that I think is one of the small, but it can be really critical for your company. I mean, today, in today's business world, generally throughout the country, all I read and see and hear from folks, it's hard to find candidates. It's hard to find job prospects. And... To me, always uh, in my career, with rare exception, the best hires I was able to make, the ones that really stood out, were people that were referred to me. And that's what I'm talking about with the referral hiring system. 
Uh, and there's some reasons for this. Uh, first, your employees know your company. So if your employees refer a candidate to you, a prospect to you for hiring, they know your business and you're going to uh, can assume with some degree of certainty they've communicated the good things and perhaps the bad things about your company to that prospect. So that prospect comes to the table, if you will, to go into the interview process with a lot of knowledge or some knowledge about your company. And that's a good thing. Secondly, an employee who loves their job and company will only bring new people in that they trust and they'll help build the company and maintain the great company they work for. To me, that's a little bit of common sense. I work at a company. I love the company. I love what I'm doing. I'm not going to recommend someone to the company, I'm not going to refer someone to the company that's going to come in and be a bad employee. And that leads into the third thing, and that's sort of the godfather responsibility, I call it. When I bring someone to the business, then forever they're my responsibility. And again, this goes back to the idea, I love my job, I like my company, whatever my motivation is, and when I refer somebody in, I want them to love the company, enjoy the work, be part of the team. I'm not going to bring people to the table that are going to do the exact opposite and not enjoy the job, not care about the company, care about what we're doing, and so on and so forth. On top of that, I have the godfather responsibility. It reflects on me as an employee when I recommend someone to join our family. So the three steps to building referral hiring in your company, first of all, build a great culture. Uh, this gets talked about a lot, and it kind of ebbs and flows as a popular business topic, but the fact is you've got to build an atmosphere, an attitude, if you will, in your business that people want to be a part of. They want to come to work every day, not just for the paycheck. In fact, that's probably the worst reason they come to work is just for the paycheck. People need to want to work for your company. And to me, that reflects directly on the kind of culture, if you will. And pick another word if you're tired of the word culture. But the idea is that people want to work for you and your business. Secondly, hire only those referred by employees. You know, there are some companies, and I was reading over the weekend about some, that they basically won't hire, quote unquote, outsiders. They will only hire people that are referred. Now, Obviously, they've done a lot of legwork. They've spent a lot of time developing this so that their employees are motivated to bring people, new prospective employees, to the company. But they make it a general policy and communicate that to the employees that basically we're only looking to hire people that you as employees bring to us, okay? Make sure your workforce knows that if you decide to do it. I think any company can say, hey, this is our preference. First choice is to bring to us people you know. These are the people we want to hire. This is our choice. Great opportunity, I think, in your company to build the spirit, the culture of your company by letting employees know that they have a role in the direct role, really, in the hiring of new employees. And thirdly, I think it's important, very important, to acknowledge and celebrate those who refer a good employee to you. Sometimes some companies choose to just have a simple thank you, but I encourage you, if you have just a simple thank you to people, celebrate it. Let other employees in the company have a chance to pay their respects to the person who referred another good person to the team. You also obviously can build an incentive plan. I've done that in businesses that I owned and managed, simple incentive plans, and that motivates some people uh, to get out there and find people. So the motivation is what you want. You want your employees to think about people they know, people they meet, and determine potentially are going to be good employees for your company, so they incentivize it. And again, I've done that in my career, and it works, and it's a good thing to do. But a simple thank you many times, if done correctly and celebrated in any regard, you need to celebrate each referral that comes into your company. Well, did you know you can build your own referral hiring system? I just gave you three steps. Build a great company, great culture, one that people want to be a part of. Two, perhaps make it where you only hire people who are referred or at the very least give preference to, but be sure you communicate that to your workforce. And then thirdly, and really importantly, acknowledge and celebrate those that have been referred in, perhaps incentivize the process 
but be sure you celebrate it. So there you are, something you can do, I believe, to increase the chance that you'll make the right hire more often than not. We're going to take our final break for the day, and when we come back, I'm going to offer you my one best consult tip of the week, three things that I think you must do if you want to succeed in business. So please stay with us. We'll be right back. What is homelessness? Have you seen parents struggle to find a job without having transportation or childcare? What about the children sleeping in cars with nothing to eat? Families shouldn't have to struggle to survive and children should not be homeless. Family Promise of Montgomery County serves the needs of homeless families and their children. Learn about ways you can help and learn about partnership opportunities at www.familypromiseofmc.org or call our day center at 936 941-8778. Don't miss Lone Star Community Radio on TV and YouTube. Our talk show and music shows are featured on Our City TV, Suddenlink Channel 12, and have their own YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe to keep up with posted shows and comment on them below the video. It's all about business on the Weekly Business Hour every Monday at 11 a.m. on Lone Star Community Radio. You are listening to the Weekly Business Hour, and this is Rick Schuster, your host, welcoming you back to our fourth and final segment of today's show. Before I get started on that, though, I want to remind you, if you're listening to the program, you too, your company, can be a sponsor of the Weekly Business Hour. You just need to reach out to me by email, uh, rick, R-I-C-K, at IRLoneStar.com. That's right here at the station. Just send me an email, say you have some interest in learning more about how to be a sponsor. Great opportunity for you to showcase your business, get yourself, your company on the radio. So please reach out to me at rick at IRLoneStar.com. Well, the three things I believe, my opinion, that you must do if you want to succeed in business. Obviously, there are many things that you have to do. There are many working parts, always needing to be in sync, but always seeming to break down. And that's where you come as a manager to reduce that. And when it breaks, you fix it. But I believe there are three critical things that if you don't do each of these, then your chance for success goes way, way down. Okay? You made a decision, you started a business, you bought a business, you went in business for yourself. You're going to be your own boss. That's the dream of so many people that I talk to in my practice and working with people. They want to be their own boss. They want to drive their own ship. They know there's risk involved, but they really want to take the chance and it's their opportunity. And I think that's great, but I think it's very important. The first thing you've got to do is develop a plan for your business. Now this goes without saying, but let me assure you, Less than 7% of the companies, large and small in America, have any kind of plan. Now, it could be a business plan, strategic plan, marketing plan. Have a plan for their business. That's hard to believe. And you got to believe that the large companies, because they typically have debt and whatnot, and lenders really like to see plans, have plans. But that means most small businesses. I took a, a, a poll recently of seven business people who I know, and I asked all of them, do you have a business plan? Do you have some kind of plan you follow about where you're going with your business, the action steps you need to, not one of them had any kind of written down plan. I think they all had a plan in their head, but accountability sort of slips and falls when you don't have it on paper, I believe. So the first step to finding success, write down your plan. There's no secret to the format. Uh, it should be based on the assumptions and various decisions you have made for your business. Don't forget, it's your business. But there are templates available online. There's all kinds of forms that you can use out there. It doesn't need to be 50 pages. That's what the bank might look for if you go in to make a loan, but just a page, two, three, four, whatever it takes to give you the roadmap that you need for your business. Very, very important because you need a roadmap, one, for accountability for yourself, and two, so you can share it with your employees as your, as your business grows and you bring in employees so they know where you're going. The second step is to determine what you don't know about running a business. Now, 
this sounds maybe a little negative, but what don't you know about running a business? I mean, I have never in my life met someone who's starting a business that knew everything about running a business. They may have, as I grew up in a family business, so they got a chance to really observe. And if you listen and follow, yes, you're better prepared to start a business, but there's still areas that you've got some uncertainty that you don't really know everything. And this is where you need to be able to reach out to other resources and individuals. This is where a mentor comes into play. And I always encourage people to find one or more mentors to work with them in their business, to guide them, to be able to have someone you can bounce off your ideas, your challenges, and know that they're going to tell you the truth about what they think about your idea, whatever it is in your business. Mentor is just critical, whether it's someone that does it for free or like I do, I charge for my services and my experience, get yourself a mentor, and also look for other resources that can help you learn the things you don't know. Because if you do learn them, you're going to make fewer mistakes and suffer under that hard taskmaster called experience. So perhaps learn the easy way, not the hard way. The third and final thing I think you have to do is put a financial management system in place in your business. Okay, what am I talking about? Well, first of all, cash flow. I mean, your expenses, your revenue, put in place a system where there's accountability for the money coming in and the money going out. One of the key things uh, to financial management systems that I believe in, unfortunately, people miss this, is make sure it's accurate and it's timely. In other words, your numbers that you get, say, in the cash flow are accurate and they're timely. Now, what is timely? Timely. Uh, I was amazed at one point in my career, I helped a client engage a bookkeeping service to produce their monthly financials. And after the first month, and I vetted people, and this particular service had eight, 10 employees, and I visited their business, and all these people had their heads down working on financials, and I visited with the owner of the business. She definitely had a grasp of bookkeeping, record keeping, all the important things. But then the first month came, and we didn't get a statement. It was the 5th, the 10th, the 15th, still didn't have a statement. Well, one, I was embarrassed. I called up and says, where's the statement? Oh, we'll get it. Well, the next month, the same thing happened. So I picked up the phone. I went by to see them, made an appointment, went by to see them. And she explained to me, she says, you know, you're very unusual. I said, what do you mean? You want your information timely. I said, yeah, we agreed by the 5th or 7th of the month. I believe it was the 7th of the month. You would have a accurate financial statement for us. And she says, we just don't have, we just don't do that. And I said, why? Because none of our clients really care. They don't want it. They, some of them want to make sure they get it, but it's just, I said, you've got to be kidding me. This is unbelievable. Make sure your numbers are accurate and they're timely because if they're timely, you can utilize some of that information, even though it's in the past to properly run your business today and into the future. The other financial tools that are critical as part of your system are obviously your profit and loss statement and your balance sheet. You know, my dad was real big about saying, hey, the balance sheet is a lot more important than many people give it credit for. You need the profit and loss statement to go with a balance sheet. Understand both of those reports. You may need some additional education. That's where these other outside resources come into play. Lots of places you can get an education about how to read a financial statement. If you have a mentor, typically the mentor can help you with that understanding. But be sure you understand your profit and loss and your balance sheet along with your cash flow statement. Make sure you have these. Because again, I believe if you don't have any one of these three, if you don't have a plan and you don't seek out help about the things you don't know and you don't have a financial management system in place, then you're going to fail. Uh, I, I mean, I don't see no other way around it. Yes, there are other things that can cause the failure of a business, such as the loss of a major account, uh, the, the downturn in the economy, things that perhaps shouldn't cause a failure, but many times they do. But it's critically important you have those things. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll put it on your calendar to join us again next Monday right here on IR Lone Star when Doug Thorpe will join us once again for part three of our conversation building better teams by becoming a better leader. Look for a podcast of today's show again on the weekly Business Hour page at IR Lone Star. 
www.thewealthgroup.com, on our Facebook page, YouTube channel, and other social media at the Weekly Business Hour. Thank you for joining us, and remember, stay in touch with what's happening in Montgomery County right here on Lone Star Community Radio. And until next week, I encourage you, stay engaged and keep your focus on what counts in your business. Thanks. The Weekly Business Hour coming to you every Monday from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. right here on IRLoneStar.com and Conroe's FM 104.5 and 106.1. I'm Rick Schistler, your host, and I encourage you to join us this coming Monday, June 24th, to hear the final part of our soup to nuts conversation, building better teams by becoming a better leader with Doug Thorpe, a well-known author and business coach. Remember, Monday at 11 a.m., listen to the Weekly Business Hour. Thanks for checking out this show on Lone Star Community Radio, Montgomery County's community radio station. This show is owned and produced by Lone Star Community Radio and recorded live from the LSCR studios in downtown Conroe, Texas. For more information about the show, to be a guest or to sponsor, just contact the studio at 936-647-3776 to leave a message or email us at lscrstudios at gmail.com.